infamous ancient manual, obsessed with a deadly mission. To prosecute, torture, and kill witches. And you can have this hammer. You can use it to smash them. For two centuries, the book helps ignite a reign of terror. Behind it, tales of madness, forgery, and scandal. What forces fueled its power? How and why did the book endure more than all others of its kind? As soon as you accept the notion that there is this vast, hidden, secret conspiracy of devil worshippers, a small town can be engulfed in, in a full-fledged witch panic. Now an international team unlocks the bizarre secrets and fatal allure of the Witch Hunter's Bible. Translation, The Hammer of Witches. 256 pages of dense Latin text, written in 1486. It is arguably the most comprehensive encyclopedia and legal manual ever created to prove that witches are real and must be put to death. It provides a authoritative text that, that other people can use to understand witchcraft, to make sense of this phenomenon. In the 16th and 17th centuries, with an estimated 30,000 plus copies in print, the hammer of witches spreads across Europe like a plague. In time, the book's ideas even reach the new world. By the end of the witch craze, the hammer helps send an estimated 60,000 victims to their deaths. But how did it become such an infamous and deadly witch hunter's bible? The hammer didn't invent the witch hunt. Europe's first major witch hunts predate the book by more than a century. and other religious scholars had already written texts condemning witches. Yet to this day, over half a millennium later, no other medieval book on witchcraft is more notorious, read, or debated than the Malleus Maleficarum. What are the secrets to its enduring legacy? What drove its influence and allure? The witch hunting activities of the 1500s and early 1600s are driven by the intellectual ideas that are popularized by the Malleus. The Malleus Maleficarum went through in many editions, was read by lots of people, and there are certainly a great many people who had known about witchcraft previously, may have had some doubts about it, and now they get persuaded. Now, a team of international experts, translators, and medieval scholars are investigating, examining original editions and detailed facsimiles on two continents, uncovering rare documents, and following the trail of evidence to answer the question, why was the hammer of witches so powerful? The evidence begins over 500 years ago with one of the most notorious witch hunters in history. A man some call deviant, even mad. 1485, Innsbruck, Austria. 48 women and two men stand accused of the practice of harmful magic, witchcraft, their alleged crimes, cursing adulterous lovers, using spells and elixirs to cause illness or death. 
one woman bears the brunt of the charges. In her trial, a visiting inquisitor takes command and ignites a scandal. He asks her about sex acts performed under diabolical influence. He insists sexual promiscuity is a portal to her witchly powers. A lawyer sent by the local bishop intervenes. He accuses the visiting inquisitor with unseemly and unlawful conduct. He demands all charges dismissed. The visiting inquisitor leaves Innsbruck, his trial a failure. He is Heinrich Kramer, Latin name Institoris, a famed inquisitor, and future author of The Hammer of Witches. 1486, fresh from his failed Innsbruck trials, Heinrich Kramer in Statoris begins his masterwork, a book to prove that witches are driven by weakness and lust, vessels by which the devil is made flesh, witches who must be rooted out and burned. It will be Heinrich Kramer's ultimate vindication, a book of vengeance, forever silencing his critics and persuading the world his witch hunter's Bible. When he wrote the Maleus Maleficarum, Kramer must have been very, very angry and very, very frustrated. He had failed as a witch hunter. In a way, it is his last will, if you like, his testament. The Hammer's greatest achievement was to take one man's vengeance and make it a cause. One possible clue to its power? For centuries, Kramer's masterwork appeared to have the blessings of the church, yet looks can be deceiving. November 2009, Berlin, roughly 400 miles from where the Hammer of Witches was born, the German Historical Museum. Searching for evidence that might explain the book's unusual success, Malleus investigators Dr. Johannes Dillinger and Dr. Andre Schnitter want to examine two copies up close. Available for viewing exclusively by appointment, this carefully preserved hammer of witches is more than 500 years old. Any quest to understand the book's success must begin with a critical document contained inside it. Some have seen it as the most powerful endorsement the hammer ever received from the church itself. It's called a papal bull. Similar to a royal proclamation, a papal bull is a document signed by the Pope stating an official church doctrine. It remains one of the most notorious bulls in history. The Sumus Desiderantus, known as the Witchcraft Bull. The bull states two important points. First, it warns against witches. This bull described what witchcraft actually is and what witches do. We make in some magical way hail and, and thunderstorms. Uh, we make people and livestock infertile, they kill and maim. And second, it gives official sanction by name to Heinrich Kramer to hunt them down. Today, it's hard to imagine the sway such a papal decree would hold, persuading readers that witches are real and that the hammer itself had the blessings of the highest religious leader of the day. But there's a problem. As the investigators zero in, the bull is more notable for what it doesn't say. At no point does it mention anything about the hammer of witches. The papal bull is dated three years before the hammer was published. 
So why is it included in nearly all editions? The answer begins in 1484. According to some historians, Heinrich Kramer prepares to travel to Rome. He is frustrated by authorities refusing to cooperate with his witch hunts. He brings a letter arguing for permission to prosecute witches under full sanction from the Pope. Kramer also brings an undisclosed sum, payment to help persuade the Vatican to agree to his request. Kramer's letter works. It becomes the foundation for the Sumis Desiderantis. The papal bull says nothing about the hammer at all. Yet Kramer knew exactly what would happen if he put it front and center. This bull came in very, very handily because it suggested that the Vatican was perfectly all right with everything the Maleus Maleficarum had to say. For the investigation team, the misleading bull reveals a striking possibility that the Malleus Maleficarum's success had nothing to do with certified papal approval, but everything to do with the master manipulator. Heinrich Kramer, a man obsessed with silencing his critics and changing forever the way the world saw witches, an evil that must be stopped. The Malleus Maleficarum, Witch Hunter's Bible, is about to be born. 1485 to 1486, the Tyrol region near Austria. Author Heinrich Kramer's Hammer of Witches begins to take shape. He is determined to create the definitive encyclopedia on the witch hunt. Kramer takes literally everything he can get his hand his hands on to prove that there are witches and witches are really, really dangerous. The hammer describes the dangers of witchcraft in detail. Clairvoyant sorcery, spells for deadly diseases, babies kidnapped and sacrificed, conjurations of natural disasters, blood drinking acts of cannibalism, Witches flying through the air to meet demon consorts and attend ceremonies of black magic, sabbats. In his book, Kramer also incorporates real-life examples of his own witch hunting. One sensational trial becomes his model. A trial that took place before his humiliation at Innsbruck. He sees it as a perfect, deadly witch prosecution. 1484, Ravensburg, Germany. A hailstorm has ravaged the region. The suspected cause? Witchcraft. In court, eight women face a delegation of local officials. And one other. Heinrich Kramer. Nearby is the Inquisitor's favored punishment, the strapado. Pulled upwards by their wrists, victims hang, often until their arms dislocate from their sockets. At last, according to Kramer, two women confess to acts of demonic sorcery, causing deadly storms. Heinrich Kramer orders the women burned alive. For Kramer, Ravensburg is a great success. Two years later, in his masterwork, he depicts the trial as only he can, a detailed account from the executioner himself. In the town of Ravensburg, two women were burned to ashes 
They endured many injuries at the hands of the devil. Yet to sell his book, Kramer fears his own credentials are not enough. To persuade his readers, he needs an illustrious co-author. What happens next is one of the biggest controversies surrounding the Hammer of Witches. Virtually all editions of the book credit two men, Kramer and a professor from the prestigious University of Cologne, Jakob Sprenger. Jakob Sprenger was one of the leaders of the Dominican monks in Germany. Some experts believe Sprenger did nothing more than write the Hammer's preface. Others, that the more distinguished scholar acted as a literary advisor. And still others believe Sprenger had nothing to do with the book at all, that Kramer simply forged the illustrious Sprenger's name. The reality was that Sprenger was much better known than Kramer, and that's exactly why Kramer put his name on it. One thing nearly all scholars agree on, Heinrich Kramer was almost certainly the dominant author. The hammer, inflamed with passion, filled with sensational language, is personal. November 2009, at his offices at the University of St. Andrews, Scotland, Malleus team investigator and historian Peter Maxwell Stewart looks to the text for signs of Kramer's overriding influence. When you're looking at, uh, at his Latin, some words suddenly spring out from the text as being highly emotional. He could have chosen other words, but he actually chose these. The word sporgitiae is a very vivid and um, a particularly nauseating term. It means filth, disgustingness. Pilocatio is an extremely unusual word. It means chasing after mistresses. He says that this is what witches make men do. It's that kind of language that leaps off the page every so often that illustrates Institoris's personal attitude. 1486. By year's end, the hammer of witches is complete. A reference manual that goes further than any book before it, explaining the dangers of witchcraft. Witchcraft, one of the fundamental problems with it is it doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. Uh, this whole notion that there's this diabolical conspiracy and that, that God allows Satan to give these women fantastic supernatural powers doesn't sound very plausible on its face. And what the Malleus does is explains exactly how this works, why God does this, and the evidence that exists to demonstrate that witches really do exist. To make its case, the book is organized in three parts. Part one, a philosophical argument proving the existence of witches. Part two, a guide for clergy, how to recognize witchcraft in your own community. And three, the most infamous of all, a legal manual, practical handbook for accusation, prosecution, and the witch death penalty. His book complete, Kramer could have no way of knowing how successful his three-part Witch Hunter's Bible would become. In time, it helps send witches to their deaths by the tens of thousands. To understand the Witch Hunter's Bible's deadly impact, scholars examine the way the world saw witches, both before and after Heinrich Kramer Instatoris's Hammer of Witches. Isolated accounts of witch hunting date back to the Dark Ages. Europe's first widespread witch craze erupts in the mid-1300s, a century before the Hammer. As witch hunting spreads, it also changes. What began as an effort to stamp out pagan sorcery the conjuring of weather, healing and practical magic, 
transforms into a far more dangerous hatred. Witches morph from heathens into satanic heretics. By the time of the Malleus Maleficarum Hammer of Witches in 1486, there is still much debate over exactly how witches get their demonic powers. Up to the time of the, the Malleus, people disagreed very strongly, even people who believed in witches. The hammer provides the answers. To the question, how does Satan corrupt humans, the hammer's answer is frightening. He makes them his accomplices, and lusty women are the most likely accomplices of all. Carnal lusting is insatiable in them, and for this reason they cavort with demons. Kramer is the one who provides the most systematic proof that these accomplices are almost always women. The title of the Malleus Maleficarum identifies witches as female. Kramer himself says that he refers to female witches rather than to generic or even male witches. To the question, why are witches to be feared and exterminated? The answer is even more terrifying. Witches are a sign of the apocalypse. Before the day of judgment, they will all be equally cast down into hell. Institoris ties this harm, this devil worship, uh, to an apocalyptic fear of the end of days. God is so angered by the heresy of witchcraft that, first of all, he's permitting Satan to you know, help witches do terrible things. Second of all, he's going to eventually bring the world to an end. Not eventually, he's going to do it sooner rather than later. The Tyrol region, December 1486. Offering new answers to age-old fears and superstitions, Heinrich Kramer's masterwork is almost ready to be published. Yet to help guarantee the book's success, one final document is missing, a critical review called an approbation. Like a modern-day celebrity endorsement, without an approbation, the work may be doomed to failure. It wasn't absolutely a given that everything that he claims in this text was going to conform with Catholic orthodoxy. I mean, his claim that you know, witchcraft is the greatest heresy, that seems kind of odd, actually. And so I think that he may well have legitimately been concerned that there was something kind of sketchy about some of his claims. And so he wanted the faculty to give its endorsement. Heinrich Kramer, wants an approbation from one of the most prominent religious schools of his time, the University of Cologne. Conveniently, his credited co-author, Jakob Springer, is one of Cologne's most respected professors. Malleus scholars are divided on what happens next. Some say Sprenger and Kramer approach the school asking for a written endorsement. Sprenger's authority makes it an easy sell, and several scholars sign the approbation. Others say Kramer goes alone, impatient, demanding, he doesn't get what he wants. Incredibly, he falsifies signatures and later puts them in print. Yet would Kramer have dared such a blatant lie? Centuries later, two Malleus investigation teams work in tandem, examining the approbation up close. Berlin, only a few hours drive from the University of Cologne, at the German Historical Museum, doctors Dillinger and Schneider look for signs of forgery. Meanwhile, in Washington, D.C., 
Malleus historians Drs. Hans Brodel and Christopher Mackey plan to inspect the approbation in one of only several Hammer First editions in the United States. Kept at the Library of Congress under strict security, this copy was rebound centuries later, yet inside it is intact, dated 1487. The Hammer's approbation contains two parts. The first is a specific review of the book, signed by four Cologne scholars, witnessed by a notary. The second part is merely a vague approval of witch hunting in general, signed by eight scholars. And for these signatures, the notary was absent. The notary responsible uh, admits that he wasn't actually there to witness the signing of the second bunch of signatures. And that's a little strange. That's what a notary is supposed to do. And other evidence questions the signature's validity. At least two people who signed it later on claimed that they had not done so. And this would, of course, suggest that this is in part a forgery. Yet even if the signatures are real, they may not be what they seem. In fact, there's this one gentleman, Andreas, who even admits that, that he endorses the book only at first glance. Um, he, hasn't, he admits that he has not read the, the document carefully. And I think that's probably characteristic of quite a number of these guys. All told, the implication is alarming. The only religious scholar who specifies he did read the book carefully is a Cologne senior professor, and he finds it disturbing. He says, this is decidedly not a book many people should read. This is a book for experts. So he does consider this book, well, let's say problematic, maybe even dangerous. The approbation is included in virtually every copy of the Malleus Maleficarum. To all who read the book, there would have been no reason to doubt such a powerful endorsement. The approbation helped make the Hammer of Witches a phenomenon. By late spring 1487, with the approbation complete, the Malleus is ready for the public originally printed in the town of Speyer, Germany. The Witch Hunter's Bible is about to be unleashed. One of history's most infamous witchcraft books might have fallen into obscurity. But the Hammer of Witches coincided with an invention that changed the world. Kramer was influential in part, not only because he was systematic, but also in part because he knew how to exploit the technology of printing. After the introduction of the Gutenberg Press in 1454, authors could disseminate knowledge widely. For the first time in history, anyone with the means could write, print, sell, and distribute a book, influencing public opinion on a massive scale. With 150 copies released in its first print run, followed by hundreds more, promoted and sold to church and secular officials, local clergy, universities, and libraries, the hammer of witches spreads like a blaze. In time, some estimate it sells more than 30,000 copies. The hammer hits the public at the dawn of the 16th century, a volatile era of clashing nations and epic wars. A time when the Catholic Church faces some of its greatest internal strife and the Protestant Reformation is brewing. Into this chaos, the book's descriptions of apocalyptic witchcraft help create a culture of fear and suspicion. He was convinced, as were a large number of people at the time, that uh, witches were on the increase. Satan's influence was growing within Europe. And that unless one did something about it, uh, 
then uh, Europe will be overwhelmed. Practices described in the Malleus become commonplace. Posting notices on town doors, inciting villages to name names, invasive interrogations, how to use torture, and when to institute the death penalty. Yet from its first printing, not all approve of the Hamas ideas. Over the next decades, a few critics raise strong objections. Almost immediately, there are folks ready to stand up and say, this doesn't make any sense. But it is not enough. Violent witch hunts continue across Northern Europe, wreaking havoc in Switzerland, France, Germany, and beyond. Read widely, the Malleus helped spark a new scourge of persecution, torture, and death. Fifteen sixty-three, Wiesensteig, Germany. Less than a century has passed since one of the Hammer of Witches' most notorious trials, the so-called demonic hailstorm of Ravensburg. The same accusation strikes again. This time, a prominent nobleman rounds up a group of women, accusing them of the identical crime conjuring the devil to create a crop-destroying hailstorm. Incited by the noble landowner, the case bears two of the most critical elements necessary for any witch hunt, panic and patronage. You always need a prince who is really willing to lend his power to witch hunters. You need a prince who is willing to accept witch trials in his courts. In addition, in close-knit communities, blaming neighbors for unexplained phenomena makes sinister sense. From time immemorial, people in small, claustrophobic contexts, like villages, have had trouble with each other. One thing that this has led to in many societies is, in fact, this notion that certain people have the power to harm other people. In a festering witch hunt, hysteria feeds upon itself. The common people are eager to come forward and identify um, a known malefactor. She's a witch, she's a witch. People are buying into this notion of diabolic witchcraft. A small town can be engulfed in, in a full-fledged witch panic. Suspected witches are most often peasant women. Some practice herbal medicine, others perform supernatural conjuring. Some are mentally ill, many are simply beggars. Their only crime? Poverty. According to the Hammer, the weak are the most dangerous. They're very deeply depressed, and along comes this extraordinary personage who turns out to be the devil, or a demon, um, and promises, if you do what I tell you to, I will restore your fortunes. At Wiesensteig, the women are tortured. Inquisitors who consult the Malleus Maleficarum's Witch Hunter's Bible know it is the surest way to get a witch to confess. If the person does not confess the truth, a second or third day of questioning under torture. You can use torture to cause witches to name their accomplices. We know they have accomplices because they're part of this huge conspiracy. Among the worst devices, a head-boring iron helmet called the Skull Crusher, the Strapado, and a hand-smashing vice grip known as thumb screws. The Wiesensteig trials last for months. In total, more than 60 women confess and burn at the stake. And they are not alone. Some believe the Malleus Maleficarum inspires some of the worst acts of hatred against women in history. But 
But could such hatred, or something else beneath it, offer a clue to the book's powerful allure? November 2009. Across the English Channel, Malleus investigator Peter Maxwell Stewart believes hatred is not the author's true motivation. He looks to something more significant. The Malleus's lurid sexuality. In The Hammer, women's sexuality runs rampant. Women do more than seduce and fornicate with demons. Throughout the book, Female lust is a portal to Satan. Sorceresses lying on their backs, naked above the navel, their limbs in arrangement suitable for that filthy act. They're also much more emotional than men, which springs in part from their, um, from their sexuality. They can't control themselves, and a man is inadequate to the task then women are wide open to control by Satan. And that is partly, at any rate, why you find such a, an emphasis on sexuality in uh, the Malayos. The book's indictment of female sexuality helps justify new rounds of persecution. Institor specifically says in the Malleus that we're living in an age of women, where women are running the show, where women's lusts and carnality are spreading horrible perversion everywhere. And I think that Institoris finds this domination of women to be a terrifying prospect and something that absolutely has to get stopped. But could the book's unusual sexual content help explain its lasting impact? To understand the Hammer's fixation on sexuality, Malleus investigators examine a unique paper trail. A series of letters chronicle the most notorious sex scandal associated with the Hammer of Witches' author. Letters written during Heinrich Kramer's failed Innsbruck trial. Everybody in Innsbruck, I think, would have been perfectly happy had he just proceeded against magic. And he starts talking about this, you know, conspiracy of diabolic witches, women who are riding around at night. Uh, he's particularly fixated on female sexuality. I mean, why on earth would you be asking her all these questions about sex? This is actually kind of weird and creepy. You must just say, this is typical of a witch's character. This is typical of a witch's behavior. To the extent that when we're trying a witch, we want to find out about that woman's background because if she has a history of sexual irregularity, that buttresses the accusation of witchcraft. The letters sent back and forth between the bishop, local authorities, and to Kramer himself, uncover a startling picture of Heinrich Kramer Institoris. Institutoris's behavior was extremely disturbing. He was riding roughshod over procedure. He was browbeating the accused. After the trial, Institutoris's behavior is even more disturbing. He lingers in Innsbruck, badgering accused women. The bishop sends further angry correspondence, demanding that Institutoris leave. There's one famous letter in which the bishop yeah, warned Institoris that uh, there could be violent action, that the husbands of the accused could take violent action against him. The bishop who chased him out said he was actually a madman. This is the man responsible for the hammer of witches. Could such deviants have helped sell the Malleus Maleficarum's radical ideas? Some scholars note, like the racist lies in Hitler's Mein Kampf or other deadly propaganda, in many of history's most hateful texts, the more outrageous the prejudice, the more successful the persuasion. One thing is certain. By the dawn of the 17th century, the Hammer's legacy of persecution has spread further. As the witch hunt hysteria makes history in the English-speaking world, there, in some of the most fabled witch trials ever, the ideas behind the Malleus Maleficarum make one of their final indelible marks.
1692. The witch hunter's Bible's most dangerous idea helps turn a colony into a mob. Two communities make up the region of Salem, Massachusetts. Rumors of violent acts of witchcraft against children begin to circulate, and accusations turn ugly. If your goats have been dying, your kids have, have, have gotten sick, if you can, can associate these harms with you know, threats from, from unpleasant people, you've got a case of witchcraft. Some prominent citizens dare the unspeakable. They express doubt. They question the validity of the charges and of the witch hunt itself. They too stand accused. Any who express doubt or defend their honor are suspect. Imagine living in a city today in which you knew that there were, you know, there was this secret diabolic conspiracy. Other people were blithely going around denying it, saying, oh no, this isn't true. This would seem worse than stupid. This would seem positively evil. Children bear witness. Family members die trying to protect their own kin. In time, even respected villagers hang from the gallows. In less than one year, town officials arrest 150 people, convict 29, and put 19 to death. Theories for the witch frenzy range from moldy, hallucinogenic grain to cultural repression, even slave ghost stories. But no matter what the cause, any examination of Salem's horror leads to the single most damning legacy of the Malleus Maleficarum. A simple idea hammered home in the book. That disbelief itself equals heresy. Put another way, questioning the very existence of witches makes the skeptic an accessory to the crime. Any text that begins with the bald statement that not to believe in witches is the worst of heresies, I mean, that's, a, that's an extremely provocative statement. In the psychology of witch hunts, such reasoning is the final nail in the coffin. So under these circumstances, when you have people compelled in the courtroom to name their accomplices, even those who don't have this history of practicing sorcery, even in some cases very respectable townswomen and villagers can be fingered as having been there at the assembly, having sworn allegiance to Satan. That's something new and importantly new. And today, analyzing all witch hunt psychology, scholars agree. For 200 years, by turning doubt into a crime, the Malleus helped transform misogyny, paranoia, and fear into a monstrous institution. In the aftermath of Salem and trials like it in Europe, the witch craze is over. By the end of the 18th century, some estimate the final tally of witch dead at 40 to 60,000 victims. In the dark history of witchcraft, one unforgettable figure blazes through. Heinrich Kramer Institoris. Haunted by scandal, he devoted himself to a book of vengeance, a witch hunter's Bible obsessed with a single biblical warning. Thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. <laughs> 